cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name I am so wondrously saved from sin Jesus so sweetly abides within There at the cross where He took me in Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Come to this fountain so rich and sweet Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet Plunge in today and be made complete Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has been, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for sin forsaken, and all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I do my faith and do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With His manna, He my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see His blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He is the mighty King. Master of everything, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Amen. As I walked through the doors, I sensed His presence. And I knew this was a place where love abounds. For this is the temple 
Jehovah God abides here. We are standing in His presence on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all
his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered, and earth is no more I'll still cling to the old rugged cross I believe that this life with its great mystery Surely someday will come to an end. But faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my friend I believe that the Christ who died on the cross has the power to change lives today for he changed me completely a new life is mine that is why by the cross I will stay I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I believe whatever the cost and when time gathered in his name we are in his presence we need to remember that praise the Lord for the opportunity to be able to meet here this morning and to be able to open up God's word uh, with you this morning let's read here in Micah chapter number six Micah chapter number six we're going to pick up reading there in verse number six and read down through verse number eight the Bible says wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? How shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Or shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn 
for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul. Verse number 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, only Father, we come to you this morning again. Thanking you for the opportunity you've given to us to be able to be here and open up your word. And Lord, I, I praise you and thank you for each person that's here this morning. And I just ask, Lord, that you would help each person to have their hearts open, prepared, willing to receive what you have for them today. God, I ask that you would be with me. Lord, that you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Give me the words to say. Lord, I ask that you would help me to say only those things that need to be said and leave unsaid those things need not to be said. God, I ask that there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as a personal Lord and Savior, that today, this morning, would be their day of salvation. Lord, help us as Christians to get our hearts and lives right with you as well. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So our passage picks up this morning, and it says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? And hey, that's a great question. That's a great question, and many people have that question. What am I to do? How do I come before God. Can I tell you that that's a question that everybody is asking. That's a, that's a question that people ask all over the world. And it doesn't matter the country. It doesn't matter the race. It doesn't matter the, the language. It doesn't matter the ethnicity. It doesn't matter the, uh, uh, whether you're rich or poor. That is a, a great question. That is a very important question that we need to understand that we need to know the answer to that question. There are all kinds of people, all kinds of religions in the world today that claim to have the answer to that. But can I tell you, the answer to that is right here in the Word of God. It's not in what I think. It's not in what this religion says or that religion says. It's what is thus saith the Lord. And so I, I, we need to understand the answer to that question. How do I come before the Lord? At this time in, 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 our, in our passage, at this time in the, in the life of the children of Israel, they've been in rebellion for quite some time against God. Uh, they've been doing their own thing and, and even worshiping idols, worshiping the gods of the other people uh, that were living in their land. Can I tell you that they were, they were people that were spiritually shallow. They were outwardly religious, but inwardly very sinful. They were outwardly religious, but inwardly very sensual, uh, sinful. They forgot how enormous their sin was. And the absolute high cost of their forgiveness. What does the Bible say? For the wages of sin is death. God asked them in, in, uh, here in Micah chapter 6, there in verse number 3, uh, Jesus, oh, excuse me, God says this. He said, O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? Listen, he is pleading with them and he's saying, listen, tell me what I have done to you. What have I done to thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Verse 5 says, he's still talking and he says, O oh my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from, from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Hey, listen, God was telling the children of Israel, listen, I have been with you. I have protected you. I have given you freedom from slavery. I have, I have seen you through the wilderness. I have given you a land. And, and yet, look at where you are today. Look at what you have done. You have forgotten your sinfulness. 
And you've forgotten the high price for your forgiveness. And I tell you that we here in America are kind of in the condition of the children of Israel in that day. Listen, we are, we are living our lives the way we want to live it every single day. And then we come in to church and we think, you know what, it's not a big deal. I can live my life the way I want to live it. It's not a big deal. We've forgotten our sinfulness and the high price of our forgiveness. We're people who are spiritually shallow. Outwardly, we, we say we're religious, but inwardly, we're just full of sins. Just like the children of Israel. We fast forward uh, this to some 2,700 years. And again, just an example, after a week of, of living it up, after a week of, of living life the way we want to live it, the, the living life based upon our own lustful desires, based upon what we want to do, we come to church, we'll show up at church, and we, and, and we put some money in the offering plate, to satisfy God for another week. We think to ourselves, can I, throw, can I throw God a bone? That way he'll owe me now. If this is your thought process in your life, whether it be consciously or unconsciously, can I tell you, you've missed the mark. You've missed what God wants for you. You've missed what God wants for us. Throughout the Bible, the Bible tells us over and over and over again that, that hey, it's not about the sacrifice. Well, Pastor, look at here. I am here on a Sunday morning, on a, on a brisk Sunday morning. I could be at home, still underneath my blankets, nice and warm. But look at what I've done. Look, Pastor, I've, I've come. I'm not, I've not only come, but I have put some money in the offering plate. The sacrifices I'm making. Throwing God a bone. Can we li really live our life that way and think that we're going to be blessed by God? Can we really live our life that way and think, hey... This is how I come to God. This is how I need to, to come to God. As we read our passage this morning, I can almost hear the arrogance and the sarcasm in the voice of the people, there, the children of Israel. What would it take to buy off God? Can God be bribed? Could I ever offer God any material thing that He wants or needs? Hey, listen, after all, He is the creator of all things. How do I come to God? Well, can I tell you that, that uh, Micah has given us the answer, but, but before we get to that answer, let's look a little bit at the questions that the that the children of Israel were asking. Number one, verse number six, it says, Wherewithal shall I come before the Lord and know, excuse me, and bow myself before the high God? He says, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? We need to understand who who they're talking about. Listen, this is the children of Israel. This is the Jewish nation, the, the people uh, that were chosen by God. These are God's chosen people, and, and they are asking, listen, do I come to God by my religion? Can I come to God by my religion? That's why they were asking, can I, can I offer him the burnt offerings of, of calves of a year old? Listen, that was part of their system back then. They were saying, can I come to God in, through religion? That's what we do a lot of times in our life is we just boil it all down to one thing. I've got to do something for God. 
That's, that's how I can come to God. I've got to do something for Him. I've got to be a member of this church or that church. Hey, listen, I, I am a, I'm a member of Eastside Baptist Church. I'm a member of this religion or that religion. Listen, I have been baptized. We ask, what must I do to be saved? We as human beings. Can I tell you that the people came to the Lord Jesus Christ and asked Him that very same question. And in John chapter number 6, verse number 28 and 29, we see the answer that Jesus Christ gave to those, to those people. He said, then said they unto Him, in John chapter 6, verse number 28 and verse number 29, then said they unto Him, what shall we do? that we might work the works of God. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him in whom He hath sent. Acts chapter 16, verse number 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer, uh, whenever he was releasing the disciples, uh, he said, it, it says there in verse number 30 and verse number 31 of Acts chapter 16, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Can I tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that your religion has nothing to do with your salvation. Let me say that one more time. Your religion... Whether it be Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, you know, it does not matter. Your religion has nothing to do with your salvation. Again, you can be Baptist, Catholic, Assemblies of God, Church of Christ, you name it. It has nothing to do with salvation. Can I tell you, it's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you come to God. It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Other questions that, uh, that the children of Israel were asking, they said in verse number 7 of our text, in Micah chapter 6, it says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? Listen, these, these people were, were asking sarcastically, how do we come to God? They've been too busy worshiping other gods, and now uh, Micah is confronting them, and, and not only Micah, but God himself is confronting them about it, and they said, oh, how do we come before him? Can we come before him religiously? Can we come before him by giving sacrifice? So this is what they're saying. Is it because we've not done enough for God? Should we do more for God to try to please Him? What do I need to sacrifice to please God? Am I doing enough to please God? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, my, the fruit of my body, for the sins of my soul? They're saying, listen, can I even sacrifice enough to please God? Let's make it very clear this morning, ladies and gentlemen. That sacrifice that you and I can give, can do and give, will never satisfy the demands of God for your sins and mine. The sacrifice that you and I can give this morning, or today, or throughout the entire, our entire life, can never satisfy the demands of God for our sins. And that's exactly why Jesus Christ came down from heaven, came to this earth, lived 33 and a half years, hung on a cross, died, and rose again. Because nothing that you and I can sacrifice could ever fulfill the demands of God for our sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4, the Bible says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away the sins. Psalms chapter 51, verse number 16 and verse number 17. Psalms chapter 51. Verse number 16 and 17.
The Bible says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. But look at verse number 17. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Hey, listen. If you, want to, if you want to give a sacrifice to God, listen, you come to Him with a broken heart, fully depending upon Him. Wholly depending upon Him in your life, in your situation, whatever's going on in your life, you depend on Him. In fact, that's what, that's what God asks us. He says, listen, give your life a living sacrifice. Unto him, holy and acceptable. First Samuel chapter 15, verse number 22. Samuel is speaking here and he's talking to Saul. And uh, Saul is being rejected as being the king of, of Israel because of his disobedience. The Bible says in First Samuel chapter 15, verse number 22. And Samuel said... Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Listen, Micah is telling the, back in our text this morning, Micah is telling the people, listen, all of these questions that you're asking, all of these ways that you have said, can I come to God this way? Can I come to God this way? Can I come to God this way? Micah is giving them the response. And he says that none of these things does God require. And can I tell you this morning, none of these things is what God requires of you to come to Him. He doesn't require that you're a religious person. He doesn't require that you give. He doesn't require that you're baptized. He doesn't require that you sacrifice. What is it that he does require? We're going to see. Can I tell you, most religions in the world today say, hey, you've got to do something to come to God. Most religions in the world today say, hey, you have got to do this, you've got to do that to, to be able to come to God. But what does God say? Can I tell you that God says, it is finished. It is done. There's nothing more to be done. All you have to do is accept what was already done for you in order for you to come to God. If you believe that your church membership, your character... Your good works, your sacrifices are going to get you to God, then I must tell you this morning that you are bypassing God's way. You are bypassing God's way. The Lord Jesus says in, in John 14 6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Romans 6, verse number 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Micah tells us how we're to come to God, and we're going to look at that right now in verse number 8. Verse number 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You might be, be here this morning, you might be saying, you know what? This is saying that we have to do something. You might be a person that believes, hey, hey, listen, it says it right there. Can I tell you that the people, the religions in this world that, that say, hey, you have got to work, earn your way to heaven, they love this verse. They love this verse because, because this verse says that you, it says that you have got, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. 
They say, hey, listen, that proves it. That verse right there proves it. You've got to earn your way to God. Can I tell you, that is a false reading of this verse. Can I tell you, you cannot do this on your own. There's absolutely no person in this entire world that can walk justly, love mercy, and humble yourself before your God the your entire life. You cannot do it apart from a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul's going to tell us that. If you would look to, with me to Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 real quickly. Look there, verse number, beginning in verse number 10. I was talking about to do justly. Verse number 10 says. As it is written. There is none righteous. No not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together. Become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have Use deceit. The poison of asps is in their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Hey, can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that that is talking about the human race. That is talking about you, and that's talking about me. Paul is saying, listen, you cannot do justly. You cannot uh, love mercy. You cannot walk humbly with your God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't do it. To do justly, again, right there in verse number 10, it says... As it is written, there is none righteous. The Bible says that there are none who are just. None who are righteous. God requires righteousness. But we cannot meet that standard. We cannot meet that standard. To love mercy. What does uh, Romans chapter 3 verse number 12 say? It says there... They are all together gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. And it reemphasizes that. No, not one. Oh, well, Pastor Thomas, I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. Listen, I'm a good person if, you compare your, if, I, if I compare myself to everybody else. Hey, but can I tell you, you're not comparing yourself to everybody else. You're not comparing yourself to your neighbor. What the Bible is comparing yourself to and myself to is to God himself. And the Bible says that there is none that doeth good. No, not one. There is none that is just. In fact, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that all of our righteousness, all of the good that we can do is as filthy rags when it's compared to God. Walk humbly with God. That's, hey, this, is what, this is what Micah said. He said, this, listen, this is what you've got to do to be able to come to God is, is you've got to do justly. You've got to love mercy. You've got to walk humbly with thy God. Look here in verse number uh, 11 of Romans chapter 3. Paul again tells us, gives us the answer. If you think that you can do this on your own, you've got another thing coming. It says, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Verse number 18, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible is talking, Paul is absolutely clear about this. And he's talking about you and he's talking about me. Listen, we on our own, in our natural body, cannot do this apart from Jesus Christ. Apart from what he has done for us. And I tell you this morning that 
that I am not saying that God is discounting worship that you and I are given to God. God is not discounting. Uh, uh, he's not saying, listen, uh, the offerings that you're giving is, is useless. He's not discounting your worship this morning. But can I tell you, if your heart is not right, if you're living in sin, if you don't come to Him with a broken and contrite spirit, I tell you that your worship on Sunday morning is useless. But can I tell you, you can't do that on your own. You can't do that on your own. Listen, the Bible is absolutely clear in our passage. Going back to Micah chapter 6, verse number 8, he says, he hath showed thee, O oh man. Hey, can I tell you, whenever he's talking about that, he, yes, he's talking to the Jewish person, but he is talking to you and I today. God has shown us what we're to do, how we're to live our lives, what we're to do to be able to come to God. And again, it is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What is to do justly? To do, to do justly means that, that we do what is right all the time, no matter what everybody else around us is doing. How many of us can say, hey, that's me, I'm right there. Nope. If you're honest, you can't raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, you just didn't do justly. You just lied. It's to do, to do justly means to do what's right every time, no matter what. Can you do it? Can I do it? Hey, can I tell you, I cannot do it on my own. I try and try and try and try, and I fail miserably over and over and over again. Hey, but I praise God and that I serve a God who says, hey, if you'll come to me with your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Every single time. Hey, I can't do it. I can't live my life justly on my own. And when it talks about to love mercy, how, how many of you love mercy? Anybody in here? Let me tell you, I absolutely love God's mercy. I've got to raise both hands and both feet. I can't do it all at the same time, but that would be pretty much a, 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 pretty, a pretty good feat. But, but can I tell you, I love God's mercy in my life. But, and the Bible says that we are to love mercy, and I love mercy. But part of loving mercy isn't just you receiving mercy. It isn't just you taking, hey, you give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And there's no giving. A part of loving mercy is that you give mercy. You show mercy. You show the mercy of God to those around you. How do we show the mercy of God? We do this by sharing His grace. And not judgment. How many of us can say, hey, I've never judged anybody? Anybody? No. We do this by, by sharing his forgiveness and not blame. Hey, I've never blamed anybody in my life. We do this, we, we show God's mercy by sharing His patience and not irritation. Oh boy. Right? I don't know about you, but in, in my life, that has been, I've failed. Me and, and patience sometimes with certain, certain situations, certain circumstances, I just, I just have, can't, Find the patient. I get irritated sometimes. Is there anyone else in here like that? I'm the only one. Hey, but but showing God's mercy, 
is sharing his patience and not irritation. Showing God's mercy is sharing his kindness and not our harshness. We can be so harsh at times, can't we? We can be so bitter. We can be so difficult at times when somebody does us wrong. I'm telling you what, I, I don't know about you, but, but there are things that come into my mind when somebody does, does me wrong. There are things that pop in my mind and say, oh man, you just wait till I get you. Right? I, I can be harsh at times. Sharing God's mercy is sharing... or. Is sharing his kindness and not our harshness. Walking with God. How many of you can say in your life, hey, Pastor Thomas, I am work walking with God. Ever since I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I have walked with God every single day. There's never, ever been a time when I have doubted Him. There's never, ever been a time whenever I've, I've not known that He's been there. There's never, listen, I have always walked with God. Anybody, I'd like to shake your hand if, 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 you, can, if you can raise your hand. Because I've, I've not been able to do that yet. I've not been able to do that. But can I, can I reemphasize here what it says here? It says, and to walk humbly. What's that next word? With thy God. To walk humbly with thy God. Hey, the Bible doesn't say to, to walk ahead of your God. The Bible doesn't say to walk behind your God. But the Bible says to walk humbly with. Your God. What does that mean? Basically, it means to accept God for who He is in your life. And can I tell you, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you have come to God through the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you what He is in your life. Or let me tell you what He ought to be in your life, because this is what the Bible says He is. He is your King. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. He is your Redeemer. He is your Creator. He is your Heavenly Father. He says Himself, He says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am the King of kings, and I am the Lord of lords. And ladies and gentlemen, in order for us to be able to walk with God, in order to be able to, for us to be able to humble ourselves and walk with God, we need to understand who He is. Recognize that He is our Lord and King and Savior. We need to realize who is in control. And a lot of the times it's not who ought to be in control, isn't it? Sometimes some people in, in, in my life have called me a control freak. Whenever I'm in a car, I like to be driving. Some people say, oh, you're just a control freak. You... You don't trust anybody else. I'm not a control freak when it comes to that. I just know my ability and I don't know necessarily. But that's just who I am. Can I tell you? We cannot, in order for us to be able to walk humbly with our God, we cannot be in control. It's Him who's in the driver's seat. It's Him who is leading our life. It's us who's in the passenger seat, right next to him, no matter what. And I tell you, we've got to recognize that he is in control and humble ourselves before him. Humble ourselves before him. We've got to give him the prominence in our life that he deserves. Let me ask you this morning, is God... Number one in your life this morning? Have you come to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else? 
not depending on your religion. Let me, let me tell you, maybe you're here this morning and you're visiting, or maybe you've been a member here at Eastside Baptist Church, and maybe you're depending on your religion, your, your membership here at Eastside Baptist Church to get you to heaven. Can I tell you, you are wrong, and you're on your way to hell today. But God wants you to be with him. But God wants to give you an eternal home in heaven. But God wants you to understand how you are to come to Him. And that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. It's not like some religions teach in this world today. It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, plus your works. Plus your religion. There are religions in, the, in this world today that say, Hey, if you're not of this religion, you're not going to heaven. Show me that in the Bible. Show me that in the Bible because the Bible doesn't tell me that. I've never found that to be the case in the Bible. The Bible says if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you accept what He has done for you as your personal Lord and Savior, you can go to heaven. It's not belief in Jesus plus anything. Or minus anything. It's believe in Jesus. I tell you the Bible says that we are to. Do justly. We are to love mercy. And we are to walk humbly. With our God. And you can only do these things. Through a relationship. With Jesus Christ. Paul has already, I've already showed you this morning now that Paul says, shows us that there's no way that we can do it on our own. If you're here today and you've, asked, you've added anything to it, your works, your religion, your baptism, your money, anything, you're wrong. How do you come to God? It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, Pastor, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that I am a Christian. I've accepted the Lord as my sa- the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. There's no doubt that I am a Christian. But even, can I tell you that even Christians sometimes say, how do I come to the Lord? How, how do I do it? Listen, the Bible says that we can come boldly before His throne. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you can come boldly before His throne. Ask for forgiveness. And then, trusting in Him, walking justly in this world, loving mercy, that is, showing mercy. Yep, we're going to be receiving mercy of God, but that also means that We're showing mercy. We're giving mercy to those around us as well. And then walk humbly before your God. Christian, how are you doing with that in your life? Are you walking humbly? Or are you walking with your chest out saying, look at me. I can do this. Are you doing your best to do what's right? Hey, it's not on your power. It's not on, 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 on your strength, but it's through the Holy Spirit of God working in and through you. Then are you loving mercy? Are you showing mercy to those around you, even to those who do you wrong? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and you say, but can I tell you this morning that God wants to have a personal relationship with you? In fact, that's the reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth, because your sin is great. Can I tell you, not just yours, but mine too. Your sin is great. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Listen, that death is eternal separation from God, and that is not what God wants for you. He wants a personal relationship with you. He wants to be your heavenly Father. And today, if you'll trust what Jesus Christ has done for you, He came to this earth, He hung on that cross, and He died paying for your sin debt and for mine. And then He not only died, but He rose again 
the third day to give you hope of life eternal in him. Hey, let me tell you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've been depending on yourself, your good works, your religion, or anything else to get you to heaven, you're on your way to hell today. But this morning, you can walk out of here on your way to heaven. It's not because of anything that you're doing, but it's because of all of what God has already done for you. But Christian, what about you? Are you walking justly in this life? Are you showing mercy? Are you walking humbly with your God? Who would please stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? I'll stay in.